Last week, DC Fontana died. If you've been a Star Trek fan as long as I have, and especially if you love the original series as much as I do, you know the name DC Fontana. She was a writer, producer, and story editor on Star Trek the original series. But that description hardly does justice to her contribution to Star Trek, which was substantial. It was so significant, in fact, that I figure it's only appropriate to take a few moments to explain why DC Fontana was actually Star Trek's best writer. Dorothy Fontana, who began writing under the name DC because she found it was easier to sell scripts to producers when they didn't know she was a woman, was a part of Star Trek from the very beginning. Having worked with Gene Roddenberry on his previous series, The Lieutenant, Fontana, along with producer Bob Justman, helped Roddenberry develop his Star Trek concept. Her first script, based on an idea from Roddenberry, was Charlie X, which became the second episode of Star Trek to be broadcast, and for my money anyway, remains one of the highlights of Star Trek's first season. Fontana has a writing credit on a total of 10 episodes of Star Trek TOS, including classics like Journey to Babel and This Side of Paradise. But in her capacities as Roddenberry's personal secretary and later the series story editor, she had a hand in shaping many other episodes for which she didn't receive official credit, including a little show you might have heard of called The City on the Edge of Forever. While Harlan Ellison receives the sole writing credit for the episode, I trust everyone knows by now that very little of his script actually made it on screen. Ellison's original draft was drastically rewritten, first by Ellison himself, then by Stephen Karabatsos, Gene Kuhn, and DC Fontana. Gene Roddenberry himself did the final rewrites, but it was Fontana's draft that transformed Ellison's script into the episode we actually got. Ellison's original teleplay was eventually published, and for years, Star Trek fans have argued over which is better, Ellison's version or the version that was actually filmed. I'll do a video about that someday because it's a really interesting topic, but no matter which version you prefer, Pretty much everyone, apart from hardcore Ellison loyalists, agrees that the episode as filmed is one of the best shows the original Star Trek ever produced. And while it wasn't acknowledged on screen, a lot of the credit for that rightfully belongs to DC Fontana. So she wrote some of the best Star Trek episodes. That's reason enough to consider her the best writer in the franchise, or at least one of the best. But there's another reason why I feel DC Fontana deserves this particular accolade. It's not just that she wrote a lot of good Star Trek, it's that she, perhaps more than any other writer who worked on the franchise in its formative years, understood what Star Trek could and should be. I've talked a lot in previous videos about Star Trek's social commentary and the inclusivity of its casting. Recognizing the importance of both of those factors is essential to understanding Star Trek, and it was Gene Roddenberry who wrote them into the DNA of his creation. But there's another factor that's just as important. Star Trek is one of the most unapologetically didactic shows ever produced. It's full of passionately delivered messages about how much better our world would be if we could finally find a way to look beyond our prejudices, overcome problems like racism and sexism and xenophobia, and find unity in our diversity. But those messages don't do any good if we aren't willing to change our own attitudes and behaviors behaviors as a result of hearing them. And that's where DC Fontana comes in. Over and over again in Fontana's episodes, we see Star Trek characters put into situations that force them to reckon with choices they've made, the people they have become because of those choices, and how their choices can affect the lives of others. In her very first episode, Charlie X, we learn that Charlie's petulant, capricious nature, which compels him to use his godlike powers to bend other people to his will, is the result of being raised by non-corporeal beings who didn't understand his need for love and physical connection. The person he is now is the product of who he was and how he was treated as a child. And tragically, it is too late now for him to do anything about it. 
Fontana also lets us see Spock struggling against himself in different ways. In Journey to Babel, the struggle is between his duties to the Enterprise and to his father, Sarek, who needs surgery that will require a blood transfusion which only Spock can give. The tension between father and son is rooted in a choice Spock made as a younger man, to enlist in Starfleet rather than join the Vulcan Science Academy. Sarek wanted Spock to follow in his footsteps, as Sarek had followed in his own father's. But Spock made a different choice. He decided that his father's choices didn't have to be his own, that he didn't have to become the person his father wanted him to be. In this side of paradise, exposure to an alien spore allows Spock to openly express emotion. For a time, Spock is happy, but ultimately, with a little help from Kirk, Spock realizes that the happiness he experienced is hollow and comes ultimately at the expense of his ship and crewmates. And after shaking off the effects of the spores, he says to Layla, the woman who loves him and wants him to stay with her, I am what I am. And if there are self-made purgatories, and we all have to live in them, mine can be no worse than someone else's. God, what a beautiful line that is. Spock walks away from paradise because he discovers that staying would cost him his freedom, but also because he realizes the responsibility he owes to Kirk and the Enterprise. He chooses the good of others over his own blissful ignorance. Fontana had a special understanding of Spock, and her explorations of his character, of the things that made him noble and tragic, influenced how he was seen by other writers and by fans of the show. Four years after the end of Star Trek The Original Series, DC Fontana worked on its short-lived animated revival, which we now call Star Trek The Animated Series. In addition to her duties as an associate producer and story editor, she wrote one episode. It's almost universally considered the best episode of the entire animated series, and it centers on who else? Spock. The episode is titled Yesteryear. The Enterprise returns to the Guardian of Forever. Kirk and Spock have traveled back in time to observe the early days of the Orion civilization, while Federation historians stand by and record the images shown to them by the Guardian. And did I mention one of the historians is this guy? <laughs> According to the script, his name is Alik Am, and he's an Aurelian, but come on, that's a griffin, right? I'm no expert on mythological creatures, but I know a griffin when I see one, and that dude is a griffin. Why does that matter? Because, for reasons I'm about to get into, Yesteryear is one of the few episodes of the animated series that is still considered to be Star Trek canon. Which means this guy is part of Star Trek canon, which means DC Fontana wrote griffins into Star Trek canon. Next time you're watching Star Trek The Next Generation and Captain Picard is in the middle of one of his inspiring monologues, remember that elsewhere in the galaxy, at that very moment, is a planet populated by billions of griffins flying around doing griffin shit, all because of this woman. Anyway, back to the episode. Kirk returns through the Guardian, and McCoy's like, how was your trip? And Kirk's like, awesome! We got to witness the creation of the Orion civilization. And McCoy's like, did you find out why they're all green? And Kirk's like, yes! There's a really specific reason why they're all green, and it's hilarious, and I can't wait to tell you what it is. Then Spock returns through the Guardian, and Kirk's like, hey Spock. And McCoy's like, who the hell are you? They return to the Enterprise, where Scotty doesn't recognize Spock either. Kirk's like, what the hell is going on? How do you not know Spock? He's been my first officer for, I don't know, however long we've been on this ship. Then an Andorian guy walks in, and McCoy goes, no, dipshit, this is your first officer. So Kirk and Spock are like, okay, obviously we need to fix this, because nobody's going to watch a Star Trek show without Spock. <laughs> That's just ludicrous. We gotta change things back the way they were and get this Andorian guy out of here. And the Andorian guy is like, yeah, no, I get it. They figure out that Spock was supposed to travel back in time to help his younger self survive a Vulcan maturity test called the Kazwan. But since Spock had already traveled back in time to Orion, 
he couldn't go back to his own past to help himself, and as a result, he died at age seven. Following his death, his parents separated, and his mother was eventually killed in a shuttlecraft accident. Damn, Spock, you screwed up everything. I hope the trip to Orion was worth it. I know it was for Kirk. He got to invent the Orion slave girl. So Spock grabs a change of clothes and runs back through the Guardian of Forever, traveling to Vulcan 30 years in the past. He meets up with himself as a child and with Sarek and passes himself off as Cousin Selick. But his younger self sets out to the desert to undergo the Kazwan test ahead of schedule, and by the time adult Spock catches up to him, history has been changed again. Except this time, it's not young Spock who dies. Instead, Spock's pet Salot, Aichaya, who came along to protect young Spock, is attacked by a predator, a Lamatia. Looks like he might be kin to Battle Cat. And he sounds an awful lot like Godzilla. Bless you, Filmation, you cheap bastards. Anyway, adult Spock arrives in time to subdue the Predator with a Vulcan nerve pinch. Boy, they work on just about anything, don't they? But Aichaya has been poisoned by the Lamatia's venomous claws. Young Spock runs to find a healer. Alone in the desert with Aichaya, adult Spock tells his old pet that Things didn't happen this way the first time, that Aichaya was not harmed when he completed the Kazwan ritual. Spock uses the Vulcan nerve pinch to help Aichaya sleep through the pain. Young Spock crosses the desert to the city and convinces a healer to come back with him, but when the healer examines Aichaya, he finds that there is nothing he can do. He offers young Spock two options, prolong Aichaya's life of pain or euthanize him to end his suffering. Adult Spock tells his younger self that death is a natural part of life, and that the loss of a life should only be mourned if that life was wasted, which Aichaya's was not. Young Spock tells the healer to release Aichaya from his pain, saying it's only logical that his pet be allowed to die with peace and dignity. The two Spocks return home, young Spock having decided to dedicate himself to a Vulcan way of life. Before adult Spock leaves to go back to his own time, Sarek thanks him for his help and asks if there is anything he can do to repay him. Try to understand your son, Spock says. Back in the present, Spock emerges from the Guardian and is met by Kirk, who's like, how'd it go? And Spock says, it went fine, everything's back the way it should be. Only one small change this time. A pet died. And Kirk's like, a pet? <laughs> well, that's no big deal, right? Who gives a shit about a pet? A pet? And Spock's like, God, you're such a dick. So, okay, I made fun of it a little because I'm the worst. But in all seriousness, Yesteryear is a wonderfully written episode. And it introduces elements of Spock's background and life on Vulcan, including the Kazwan ritual, the Vulcan desert being named The Forge, the city of Shikar, the maiden name of Spock's mother, Grayson, and the bullying young Spock experiences for being half-human that were referenced or expanded upon by later live-action episodes and films, hence its widely agreed-upon canonicity. And that's neat and all, but whether yesteryear is canon or not doesn't really matter. It's Star Trek, through and through. In some of her other episodes, Fontana shows Spock or one of her other heroes having to confront their past symbolically by facing an estranged parent or a lost love or the consequences of an action they took or a decision they made. But in yesteryear, Spock confronts his past literally. He steps through the Guardian of Forever into his own youth. He meets himself as a child, and he helps his younger self learn an important lesson about death and loss and discover who he is meant to be. Fontana would revisit the idea of a hero struggling with their past self in the one and only episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine she wrote, Season 1's Dax. In this episode, Jadzia Dax is charged with a crime allegedly committed by her symbiont's previous host, Curzon Dax. Commander Sisko defends Jadzia, arguing that she can't be held responsible for the crimes of Curzon because Curzon and Jadzia are different people, but Jadzia herself never seems to fully accept that premise. Eventually, Curzon is exonerated and the charges are dropped, but Jadzia is still left to reckon with the complex truth of her identity. 
She is who she is, but she will also never be able to fully leave behind who she was, for better and for worse. Fontana would return to this theme one last time for her final Star Trek-related credit in 2006. Unlike Yesteryear, this one definitely isn't canon, but like Yesteryear, it's the best episode of its particular series. I'm talking about a show called To Serve All My Days, which is part of the fan film series Star Trek New Voyages. The episode is noteworthy for featuring Walter Koenig, who reprises his role of Pavel Chekhov. And just like Spock in yesteryear, Chekhov's older and younger selves meet face to face to help each other through a story about life, death, and how important it is to make them both mean something. Maybe it's just a coincidence that so much of Fontana's Star Trek work winds up focusing on characters living in the shadow cast by their past selves. That's how the creative process works sometimes. What you wind up saying isn't always what you set out intending to say, or even what you realized you were saying until after you've said it. Or maybe there was something in DC Fontana's own life that made her especially sensitive to the power the past can hold over the present, and compelled her to continue finding ways of exploring that idea. I don't know. Whatever the reason, I think her pattern of returning to that theme episode after episode, series after series, decade after decade, is what makes her writing so resonant and her contributions to Star Trek so indelible. Because, as I mentioned earlier, if Star Trek doesn't encourage us to re-examine how we have lived our own lives, how we might have made different choices than the ones we made, how we could change ourselves for the better going forward, then it's just a goofy sci-fi adventure show. Goofy sci-fi adventure shows with nothing important to say don't stand the test of time, generally speaking. But Star Trek has. Star Trek owes its longevity to many people, people who did their work in front of the camera and behind the scenes. No one person deserves all the credit, but no matter how we choose to divide it up, a sizable share of that credit has to go to Dorothy Catherine Fontana. She didn't create the Starship Enterprise, but it wouldn't have flown as far as it did without her. Hi, folks. So, as some of you may have expected that I was going to do, and I think a few of you even mentioned it or suggested it in comments or, or on Twitter, this was a special, unscheduled episode of Trek Actually in remembrance of DC Fontana, uh, inspired by her sad recent passing. So, this was something I just sort of stuck in the schedule, just like I did for the special episode that I did in tribute to uh, Nog following the death of Aaron Eisenberg back in October. This has been a really rough year for Star Trek fans, hasn't it? We lost Aaron Eisenberg in September. We lost DC Fontana last week. And then just a couple of days ago, we lost Renea Bergenois, who played Odo in uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine. So here's how it's going to go for the rest of the month. This week, obviously, is the DC Fontana tribute video that you just got done watching. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it a fitting tribute. Um, next week, as previously scheduled, will be the Trek Actually video about Damar. And then the week after that will be another scripted Trek Actually video that I am adding to the schedule uh, that will be a René Albergenois slash Odo video to uh, commemorate his contribution to the franchise and, uh, and to help to sort of mourn his passing as well. Because uh, René Albergenois was just a wonderful, wonderful actor who did so much good work outside of Star Trek, but obviously for us, uh, for the purposes of this series, his uh, performance as Odo is right at the top of the heap. And uh, I want to talk about Odo and I want to talk about Rene Bergenois in a video 
to commemorate his life and, and his passing as well. So we're gonna do it that way. This week is the DC Fontana video. Next week will be the scheduled Damar video. And then the week after that will be a uh, video about Odo. And then probably the week after that, I'll do a Not Actually Trek Actually where I'll do a comment response video and sort of catch up on comments from the past several videos that I've done. I didn't expect this month to be quite as packed with Trek Actually videos, but circumstances sort of demanded it and I feel like it just wouldn't be right to keep doing this series and to not acknowledge the deaths of, of people like DC Fontana who, who hopefully I demonstrated through this video. Uh, made such an amazing contribution to Star Trek and helped to make it what it is, this thing that we all love and take so much from. And then uh, similar feelings about uh, René Abergenois, even though his contribution was not in terms of writing and, and was not as long-lived as DC Fontana's, who contributed to Star Trek in many different forms across several decades, uh, René Abergenois, although he did guest star in other Star Trek projects, he, his contribution was mostly confined to DS9 and Odo, but nonetheless a, a significant contribution that deserves to be recognized in light of his death. So uh, we're going to do it that way. So uh, Fontana video that you're watching now, Damar video is scheduled next week, Odo video in memory of Renee Abergenwald the week after that. Thank you all so very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.